Okay, so tonight we're going to finish looking at the conquest, and this is kind of a big turning point whenever we're looking at history. Um, during the time of the conquest, Israel is kind of just like a minor influence in the Canaanite area. Uh, before that, you know, they're, they're a minor presence that are just moving around in, like ghosts in Egypt. Uh, before that, you know, the, the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham and Isaac, the, we, we don't really have any flesh for them. They're just people who exist outside of the Bible reference. There's no reference of them even existing. So they're, they're really they're like ghosts. It's it's very hard to pin down the stuff. We've we've looked at a lot of uh, implications, and it could have been, and and hearsay, and and we've looked at it from different angles. I've tried to argue the point that it's probable that all these things happened, but we still don't have any anything that what like we would consider nowadays history, historical evidence of these things. Well, this changes after the conquest. Um, starting next week, we start looking at the kingdom of Israel, and then it's a whole different ballpark. We have so much, so much, you know, uh, archaeology to back up stuff that we're not even going to look at all of it. There's so much. We're just going to go through the, the main highlights and, and it just thing after thing that's proven. Uh, so that's, that's, this this is the last of the of the long dark of Moria, okay guys? Uh, so let's just look at a few things. First off, dating the events fits the general timeline. We looked at that with Abraham and with all the different different things that we've looked at so far. It does fit the general timeline, even where it doesn't fit precisely. Such as when we looked at the burning of Hazor, that was in the 1400s sometime. You know, things still fit, um, even if we don't have all the answers. The events of Genesis uh, could have only happened. Um, Oh yeah, the events that we've looked at in Genesis, they could have only happened in our time frame. There's no other time that they would have fit in. Um, the law could have only been written after 14 and before 1200. That that really locks us in. You know, we're arguing about little specifics about the exact dating, but don't lose sight of the overall thing that we keep being validated in the different areas. And then obviously we saw that we saw the circumstantial evidence for the Exodus. It's at I'm not trying to tell you it's an absolute closed case. I'm just trying to say it, there's there's enough evidence to warrant uh, belief. Um, everything fits, and nothing, even the cost of slaves, is disproven. Even the costs of the slaves that are recorded in the Bible for the different periods, like, for instance, what Joseph was sold for, it matches the dating of what slaves were going for. I mean, just the smallest details, they all fit. So everything fits, and nothing is disproven over the span of... You know, hundreds of years, you have to stop and wonder, you know, <laughs> what are the chances that it honestly isn't real? So there's just a few more issues to look at, and this is one of them. How many Israelites were there that came out of uh, Canaan? Now, we know that we're looking at a, period, at a span of time about 215 years. Um... Kenneth Kitchen, in once again, I can't re I can't recommend this book enough. On his book on the reli reliability of the Old Testament, talked about how in order for them to meet measure up to their 600,000 male population in that short of a time, including uh, uh, loss of childbirth and all those different things, um, he I wish I could remember the exact number, but he estimated that they would have each each woman had to have had I think it was. 10 or 11, 11 uh, childbirths within a span of 20 years. So then the next generation would have had to have... You get what I'm saying. And uh, he did this really, really neat uh, breakdown of how it would have worked out. It seems very unlikely, but, I mean, obviously... God obviously did a miracle. The question is, which miracle did he perform? That's the question. Nobody's trying to say that the miracle was not performed, just that which one was performed. Let me show you what I mean, okay? The traditional numbering is 600,000 men, which makes a general population over, of over 2 million people. This is an extremely high number. Um, and obviously, if you know anything about history, this is, this is impossible for there to be this many Israelites. It's just not possible. I'll go through a list of different reasons. The first is found in Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8.
It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So when were they not the largest nation? Well, he just said when they were in Egypt. Okay, so let's put some pieces together. When they were in Egypt, they were considered a very tiny nation, and Egypt themselves more of defined them as a as a as a undefined people group, kind of a um, kind of like barbarians. You know, they didn't really have a clear name for them as the Israelites. And two million people doesn't, or over two million people doesn't fit that. First off, two two million people that would mean that they would have outnumbered the Egyptians. Not that they were getting a lot in number, but that they outnumbered them easily. So the question is just has to be asked, why were they so afraid of Egypt? And then also when they got to Canaan, Canaan was a series of disconnected warring tribes. You mean to tell me that, that 600,000 men couldn't take out a few dozen soldiers? This just doesn't make sense. Like, this just it doesn't fit. Um, so that, that's kind of a big issue there. Why didn't they simply overwhelm Canaan and Egypt with their vastly larger numbers? It just doesn't make sense. There, there, there weren't that many Canaanites. I mean, that just that, that doesn't fit. Um, they would have left a definite presence in the desert. Two, over two million people, you can't conceal that. We would know exactly where Mount Sinai was <laughs> because there would definitely be a trace of them there. Then we have another problem is that some of the people of Israel would still be in Egypt while the others were in Canaan. See, the, the line of people with over 2 million would be so long that some of them would still be in Egypt while others were at Mount Sinai. But that's not the image that we get. When Moses is talking, he's saying, we, all of us, were in this place camping, and then all of us were in this place camping. Have you ever traveled with, uh, with 20 people? I mean, we're talk not talking about 20 people. We're talking about over 2 million people with livestock. It's just, it, it's not possible. There's not enough space. There's not enough different distance between Egypt and Mount Sinai. Unless Mount Sinai was, I mean, on the other side of Asia, which it wasn't, by the way. Uh, that just doesn't fit. So, the land could not have supported them. This is just, this is just a fact of the land. That much cattle, that many people, the land would not have... The, the, now, obviously, we could get around all these things by saying God could have made it happen. Okay, so that, that is something we can still say. Against all odds, God caused a massively superior force to come out of Egypt and then cause them to be afraid of a much smaller force. Okay, and then uh, cause them to have to rely on him when they could have just overcame them by themselves, and then called them a small nation when they weren't a small nation. They were the biggest nation. And then somehow caused them all to compact over two million people in such a tiny area and then provided for the animals. And yeah, okay, that's possible. I mean, you know, God could have worked this out. But the thing is, God typically doesn't do things that are I don't know how to say this. Over the top, like, I don't know how to say this. Um, when God does a miracle, usually he does something that... I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say. Let me give you an example. I was at a youth camp. There was a guy that I had known for years. I went I went to on mission trips with the guy. One of his legs was longer than the other one. Now, could God have, in front of everybody, chopped off this guy's leg, had it fall to the ground and disintegrate into the air, and then caused a new leg to grow completely from scratch that was exactly... Yeah, he could have done that. But did he do that? No. What he did is he caused the leg to meet with the other one. 
Now, why didn't why didn't God cause this way big miracle? It's like, well, of course God could have done that, but he didn't. And with this, yeah, God could have caused so many impossible things to work out. Yes, absolutely. But there's just numerous problems. First off, that would mean that the Bible is not accurate. Moses was there. How could, he would have known that they were that they were the largest nation in the world. Like, why would he have called them the, the smallest? And then there's the issue that it was already a miracle that all these things happened. Why do we need to make it over the top miracle when it was already a miracle in and of itself? It's like sometimes we as Christians want to validate God so much that we have to make a miracle not just the miracle that it already is. We have to like add it and build it up into like this bigger than life miracle. It's like is God was what God did not good enough? I mean, take for instance, okay, here's another story. Hezekiah, surrounded by the armies of Assyria. Okay, this is not a good situation. There are over a hundred thousand people, all, all, all outside the wall. They're going to die, and then God causes. It says an angel of the Lord. The Assyrians attribute it to I think, and it was it the Assyrians? I think it was the Egyptians who attributed it to a plague of rats. Uh, either way. This huge force was like wiped out and dwindled. So why do we have to say something along the lines of this? It wasn't 180,000 soldiers. It was 2 billion soldiers. And they didn't just die. They died and then rotted and then burst into flames and then turned into dust and flew away into this. Yeah, it's like, yes, God could have done that thing. But we don't have to make the miracles of God bigger than what they actually are. So let's just let's just keep our keep our keep keep the possibility that this is... We're kind of building this up a little bit larger than life. Let's just hold on now. Don't don't stone me yet. Exodus 23:29 says this: I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. I don't know where God's getting his information here, but a force of over 2 million people would not have been a problem. They would have had the animals subdued. In fact, the animals would have been in remission. They would have wiped the animal population out. Uh, and then the people, he could have moved them all out of there in easily a day, and Israel would have been able to inhabit the whole year. Problem solved. There's no reason for God to have waited. But then God says here clearly that so that the things wouldn't out, outnumber them. Uh, God, I don't know <laughs> if you understand how many 2 million is, so, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Now we have a huge inconsistency, and this is the biggest problem that people have with the Exodus event. If you get aside the Pharaoh and all this thing, the impossibility of two million people going through without leaving a single trace, and then without conquering Canaan in a matter of a couple days, like, with a force that big, there's no reason why they should have, this, this thing should have been delayed 20 plus years is what the Bible says. There's no reason why it should have taken them that long. That's just not not likely. And then imagine this, okay? Hundreds of years later, Assyria has a huge force of 180,000 people. Or 175,000. Either way, somewhere around the area. Let's just say 180,000 soldiers. And that's not even half of what Israel's fighting force was. Hundreds of years before. So we have a huge inconsistency here. Now... There's two ways to look at this. The first way is to say, okay, even though it doesn't make sense, this still happened exactly like I understand it. And Israel was really this big, and all these improbable things, it's just God working this over-the-top miracle. I don't know why he did it. I don't know why he used the biggest nation in the world and why he called them the smallest nation. But that's just what I believe. Then there's the other way, which is going to be hard because... Did you know that no matter what translation you use, it's not exact word for word? Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as a perfect translation. It doesn't exist. When you're working with Greek, you look at the different things and you have to change things. Because we don't talk in the same way. Like, for instance, our translation of John 3.16 is drastically different from what the Greek says. Ours says, for God so loved the world that he gives only his son. Uh, that whosoever believe in, believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In the Greek, it's all jumbled up. The, the words aren't in the same order. 
And then we have to add some words into it because we don't talk the same way. There's just a lot of different things like that. So sometimes when we're dealing with the translation, we have it wrong. That Does that mean that the Bible is wrong? No. Does that mean that our understanding of what the Bible said is wrong? Yes, we can be wrong. We are not infallible. God's <laughs> word is infallible. There's a difference. So here's what I'm saying. This isn't as off the top as it sounds, and it completely resolves the issue. The word translated as thousand, I believe it's um, Aleph, we'll just use LP, okay? Because there's a slight modifications of the word itself. Don't worry about that. Um, this can be translated in a number of different ways. One is thousand. One is a group, which can be a clan or a family or a military squad. One is leader or chief or officer. They can be this. This one word can have a lot of drastic differences. Okay. Um, Humphreys suggested a new uh, way of um, in, in translating this passage, which I am 110% behind, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. And I highly encourage you to read read his article. You can find it on Google with a simple Google search. Um, he shows how the translation should probably be seen as 598 plus 5 of the... Th I don't really want to get into that, but the idea is 598 plus the 5 of the groups. So it would look something like this. Um, there were 598 uh, squads consisting of 5,500 men, which would add up to the 603,000 people that the Bible says that were of the fighting men. Does that make sense? So in other words, there is something here that says um, fi uh, 598 plus 5 of the, qu of the squad, and instead of reading it like that, you would read it like this, 603,000. So I mean, well, that drastically changes the interpretation. Now, how likely is this? I would put I would put my entire I would stake my reputation as a Bible scholar and as a pastor on this translation. Which one? This one. The 598 squads consisting of 5500. This would mean that the total number of Israelites would be either between 20 to 22,000. This is the big point here that I want you to get. Every single problem about the Exodus with the dates I and mean, with the numbers of Israelites is resolved with this translation. It makes no problems. There are no problems in the translation if you switch to this one. So how do we know which translation to go with? Well, first off, there's we can trace history and archaeology. If, if we can learn something through history, let's not throw away the sources of history and say, no, I've translated this way all my life, so I'm going to continue translating this way all my life. But what if we're translating it wrong? It's like I, I brought up evidence from the Bible that says that the flood was not a global flood, and yet we still continue to translate it as the whole world. The Bible says that God didn't flood the world after creation. It says that in Psalms, and yet we still cling to the whole world. Why are we not willing to have that same conversation with this? We are not saying that the Bible is wrong. We're saying that we've been translating it wrong. There's a difference in those two statements. One of the things to consider with this is that when you go through the numbers of, uh, well, of numbers and of Exodus and all these different things, um, the numbers are consistently round. This would make sense of it if it's talking about squads of 5,500 men. This would not make sense if we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. If you're counting to 603,000, then you might want to go ahead and take that extra step and just get the exact number. Why, why not round it down to 600,000? Why go 603,000? Like, what's the purpose there? So, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of questions that come up if we, if we keep with that same old translation, and we have absolutely no problems with the new translation. Now, ultimately, it comes down to this. What you are willing to accept and what you are not willing to accept. Some of you guys are going to take this and you're going to say, that's interesting. I'm not going to believe it. Or you're going to take this and say, I just don't, I just don't like that. 
And then other of you are going to see this and you're going to say, oh, okay, I accept that. Here's how much do you get. You can hang on to either view. It ultimately, it's really not going to matter too much. If you're getting in an argument with somebody about uh, the exodus, it didn't really happen, this is really going to benefit you. If, on the other hand, you're sticking with the 600,000 number and you get into that argument, you're going to be at a loss when they bring this up. But, once again, if you don't really talk to people about the Bible, then it's really not going to affect you that much. But, yeah. So a few other things to consider. Um, we know that the numbers um, are oftentimes uh, not literal. They're about. We can see this all throughout the numbering. From the, I mean, look at, for instance, and in, in, I believe it's number, the beginning of Numbers. I think it's Numbers chapter 1. Yeah. Of the people of Joseph, namely of the people of Ephraim, their generations by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Ephraim, were 40,500. Very convenient that they stopped populating in numbers of 10. Of the people of Manasseh, their generations by their clans, by their farmers' houses, according to the number of, uh, of names, from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed in the tribe of Manasseh, were 32,200. Man, they are really good at having exact children of 10. Again, Benjamin, 35,400. 62,700. 41,500. See, we have the same inconsistency the whole way through. And here's something I really want you to get. There's a lot of people who bring this up as, oh, this is proof that, that the exodus didn't really happen because the numbers are so far off. The, our difficulty in understanding and translating the numbers of how many Israelites there were in the book of Numbers and Exodus, okay, get this. This is almost a guarantee that it is as old as it claims to be. Now you might say, how does that, how does, how does us having a hard time translating something equal uh, it being old? Well, for a number of reasons. Because afterwards, in the book of, books of Samuel's and, Samuel and Kings, we don't have that problem figuring out how many Israelites there were. Now, why would we suddenly have an easier time figuring out the numbers at a later period than we did at an earlier period? Because they talked different, they recorded things different, they wrote different, and it was farther back. So it's more um, apt to have copyist errors. See the difference there? That is a clear indication that the, that the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is as old as it says it is. Because we have such a hard time with, the, with, the, with the dating the numbers. So, since the numbers of later books are less difficult as language developed. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so if, if, it, if how they translate it kind of contradicts itself so much, why, why did they translate it like that? Wouldn't they be constantly looking back to make sure what they're translating is correct? Tradition. Once something gets kind of ingrained, people will just rather follow it because they get... When we get something... When we do something for long enough, it literally becomes a personal insult to disrupt that. Okay? Like, for instance, it was a global flood. Why? Because the Bible says so. Well, actually, the Bible says that it's not a global flood. You're, 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 trying, you're, you're saying that God can't do the impossible. I didn't say that God didn't do the impossible. I'm saying you're making a miracle bigger than what it was originally. It's already a miracle that God wiped out all the human population with the flood. You don't have to make it global because all people lived in one area. See what I mean? Like you're making the miracle larger than life when you don't have to make it larger than life. And that's what people do. I mean, you, you take at, for instance, Christmas. People are so convinced that Jesus was born in a manger and stable outside, just somewhere out there, like next to a hotel or some nonsense. Nonsense that they're not even willing to reanalyze that story for what the Bible actually says because they're, they're, they're too set on that. And then if you say, well, actually, it's the lower room of a house, then people will say this. You're discrediting the Bible. You don't believe what it says. Yeah. You're, you're just, you just don't believe it by faith. It has nothing to do with faith. It has to do with following what the evidence actually suggests. People would rather follow traditions than truth. And that goes for religious and non-religious people. That's, that's a worldwide problem. We, we like to grab onto something that makes sense to us, or the way we've always heard it. And then we're unable to break through that barrier of how we... I mean, I'll give you another example. There's a pastor friend that I have who's not willing to try the certain method that I've been trying to, I'm trying to get him to start in his church 
for a while now because when he was a kid, he saw a similar thing and it didn't work. In a different city at a different time. I've tried to tell him a hundred times, look, the times have changed. You're not in that city. This, the place where you're at right now is a world different from that place over there. He's unwilling to hear it because when he was a kid, another thing happens in music. Pete, when we, the music that we hear as a, as a child, we're unable to break away and, and listen to something new when we get older. Because our brain kind of just it just gets in a rut of what we're used to. It's very unlikely that someone in their 70s is going to start listening to the music that the 10-year-olds are listening to in that time. It's just very unlikely. Yes. Can I have another example of that? Like with the U.S. being the only ones that doesn't use the metric system. <laughs> to go and change that now yeah. <laughs> and trying to get the older generations to change yeah. is just pulling them out of that. And the funny so thing difficult. about that is like there's like I think three nations – I want to say it's three nations on the in the world that don't use metric. Every other per nation does. It would be so much easier <laughs> to use metric. Everybody uses it. Get that change. It's just that we don't. We don't. We're so old this is how we do things in America. <laughs> how we do things is how we've always done things to change how we do things. No, we like habits. Yes, yeah, it's it's a little bit annoying sometimes, but eh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna lose your salvation if you think that there are actually six hundred thousand people? No. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to him. No, you're not. <laughs> you can believe either view. It doesn't matter. It's just that one doesn't make sense and one does make sense. So whatever. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I always tell people when they disagree with me, I say, you can have, you can, you can believe that it's, it's your right to be wrong. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Okay. So that takes us to the idea of the holy war. I don't want to argue about the theology of the holy war. I don't want to prove whether it's right or whether it was wrong. Or whether God is righteous or unrighteous, I I completely don't want to look into that conversation. We've already done that multiple times, and I really don't feel like it will prove whether the Bible is historically accurate or not. So we're just gonna brush past the why of the Holy War and just kind of set it in its time. Okay, Holy War was an ancient practice. We actually have, uh, I believe it's an Edomite record where he's talking about. Uh, going to war as the God commands, and then also there's there's a very popular formula in ancient documents where they say something along the lines of this: I went and did so and so in obedience to the God, whatever, or uh, in honor of the to the glory of this God, or whatever. Um, you know, uh, I went and conquered Canaan uh, in the name of Ra. May he live forever. Or, you know, whatever. I can't, can't remember any of the exact wordings right now. But that's because there's so many different ancient documents that say something very similar. I mean, trying to remember one out of the plethora of them is just a waste of your time. Um, so then there's also the issue that some of the Canaanites, uh, the Bible says, were practicing child sacrifice. Now, this is where things get a little bit uh, ironic. Ironic! Ironic! <laughs> um, some people have this idea that they started enjoying child sacrifices. Um, I haven't found much historical proof to back up that claim. Um, in fact, we have another document. I believe it's from the mm, Middle Eastern area somewhere. I want to say maybe around Uruk. One of those ancient, uh, ancient towns in the Iraq-Iran kind of area there. Um, and it talks about how the musicians would play really loudly to drown out the sound of the mother's weeping. Um, I, I want to say that's where that was. Jeez, I wish I, I wish I could remember that. The thing about ancient documents, guys, is once you read so many of them, it kind of starts to get a, a little bit of a blur unless you really study up on it. And how many times are you going to want to read that document? <laughs> I mean, honestly. Uh, anyways, uh, they did child sacrifices uh, to bring fertility and to bring protection. So kind of like appeasing the gods, uh, if we sacrifice this child, our firstborn, um, that will make it where um, our other kids will be healthy or the land will give us produce or whatever. And before you judge too harshly, I'm not trying to condone this. I'm not trying to do that at all. But uh, they lived in a much more unsteady time than we do. And it was very questionable whether you'd make it through the rest of the year. <laughs> so... Um, there was a lot more fear involved in life than there is now. In America, we don't really live in that same constant state of fear. Our fear has just became real this year when there was 
you know, a virus and riots and stuff. Now people are freaking out. But remember, these pe ancient people, they lived with this kind of constant fear on a, con on a regular basis. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that Yahweh, the God that we serve, the, the, the Christian God, he also demanded the firstborn. The difference is that Yahweh allowed for substitutions. Um, he would allow, for instance, uh, a donkey to be given in place of the firstborn child. But he made it very clear that the firstborns did belong to him. Um, as a dedication, this was something that was emphasized all throughout the law. Into the books of the prophets it was emphasized. And then Jesus, of course, was the firstborn of Mary. So, anyways. Um, the child sacrifices were focused on bringing fertility and protection. And the ironic part is that this is exactly one of the reasons why God caused them to be conquered by Israel. They were doing this thing, sacrificing their own child for the sake of bringing fertility and protection to them and their household and their and their family and all this stuff. And instead, God brought them death, destruction, isolation, bad things. And, uh, eesh, such a terrible thing. Anyway, it's unclear how many children were killed in Israel's war in, with Canaan. It's very unclear. Um, we know that there were some Midianite children killed for sure. But after that, it kind of gets a little bit muddied. Um, it's possible to translate it in a number of ways. Um, one way, uh, kind of implying that children uh, had been evacuated beforehand. It's kind of it's kind of something that we can't prove one way, 100% one way or another. Uh, we haven't found some mass child gravesite or anything that would say, hey, yeah, uh, Israel went through and conquered and killed the babies too. Like we really don't know. So, did Israel kill kill every single person, or did they just kill all the military men, or did they only kill every single person of a certain area? We don't know. It, and the Bible really allows it to be translated in a number of different ways. That's not really the key point. The key point is obviously the conquering of the land itself. But that's a discussion for another day, so we won't really get into that. Um, God did not kill the children on account of the parents' sin, and he did not kill the children on account um, that they would one day sin. We know that. We know that because God himself says that. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, for instance, he says, I tell you the truth, I do not kill, your, I do not kill you on, a, on account of the sins of the Father. I punish you for your own sins. And he makes that abundantly clear. He says it in like a hundred different ways. And then he even says this. He says, if an evil person who's done evil all their life changes their ways and turns to me, I will forgive them. If a good person does good for all their life, and you should really read the prophet Ezekiel, does, a good, does good for all his life and then turns and turns to evil, then I will punish him for the evil he's doing and I will forget the good that he did. And he, he says this in like 15 different ways. Like any possible way you can look at this, he clarifies. So, no, God did not, if the children were killed in Canaan, once again, this is really up in the air because it's hard to know for sure how to translate that. We have no archaeological proof to guide us. So it's just pretty much translated the best way that you think is possible. So, uh, if God did allow for the, for the children to be killed, um, he did not allow them to be killed for the sins of the parents. The parents died for their own sin. Um, and then there's the issue, um, is God talking about temporary punishment or eternal punishment? Those are two different issues, which takes us into the discussion about where children go when they're killed. Ugh, don't let's get into that conversation. Um, and then there's the issue that God did not allow the children to be killed as a preemptive strike that they would become evil in the future. It was for neither of those reasons that the children died, if the children did die. So, with that being said, I really don't want to get any further into that because I don't want to... We're not looking at the theology, we're looking at the archaeology, the historical proof of these things. So does the Holy War fit? Yes, absolutely, the Holy War fits perfectly in that time frame. We have no problems there. Um, then we have a little bit of a problem that comes here, but it's not a big. It's not really that big of a deal, and we can easily, is, we can easily get around this problem, and then that will be the last thing we look at at the uh, conquest. And this is also the last bit of history that we have to scrounge for evidence. Um, we have found no mass graves in Israel as of yet that would warrant child um, sacrifice. So there's the issue. That God says, yes, they are sacrificing their children, and we have nothing to prove that. I mean, I'm not calling God a liar. I'm just saying we're looking at archaeology here. Um there has been no archaeology to prove that. Um, however, once again, that doesn't mean that they didn't. It's a big place. 
Um, also, then there's the issue that Israel may have destroyed it, even if it did exist. Um, then there's the issue about um, I don't I haven't looked into this. This is just off the top of my head. I believe that when bodies are burned at a certain temperature, the bones decay. Is that a thing? It has to be really hot. So Did that brings up the question, did, would, they, would they be able to bring up that hot of a fire? I don't know. This is something that's worth looking into. I have not looked into this. This is just off the top of my head. So if that sounds completely um, unscientific, I'm super sorry. I did no legwork in that. This is something that just came to my head right now. So anyways, um, however, that shouldn't really discourage us. Carthage was a what we called a colony city. That's where a bigger city kind of branches off and does a... Another. Have you ever seen like a really big church and they have like a smaller church that they branch out? It's called a multi-site church. It, it, kind of like that, except with a city. So uh, Tyre had a colony that they established called Carthage. If you know anything about Roman history, you know that that city comes up time and time again. Um, uh, and so yeah, absolutely. And they they did sacrifice children. Carthage, Carthage sacrificed children. In fact, they were ridiculed, but as far as we can tell, the entire empire is being excessively evil. Um, however, they were a very big trade center. So as always, money won out over morals because out of the two, people usually pick wealth and power over doing what's right. Um, so anyway, Carthage continued to exist during the Roman Empire and whatnot. Um, obviously, there's a long, bloody history there. Don't want to get into that. Um, now, this suggests that the parent city uh, sacrificed children, too. That would be Tyre. Now, Tyre is in the northern area of Israel, or not necessarily modern-day Israel. I'm talking about in the Bible. Um, Tyre and Sidon, two of the um, Phoenician cities there. Uh, so that kind of implies that they did, but it's not really definite, definite, definite proof that, that they did. Um, but then that brings up the question... How many child sacrifices does it take before it's considered evil? See, do we have to find a mass grave? Isn't it evil to sacrifice even one child to a false god? Isn't it evil to just do that one time? Isn't it evil to watch a neighboring city sacrifice a child, even a single child, to their god and do nothing about it? The lack of justice involved in that, isn't that evil? So... Even if Canaan did just – it wasn't a mass child sacrifice that went on for year after year. Even if it was just one child that was sacrificed and the entire Canaanite region did absolutely nothing to prevent this or as to bring justice to that child, our, we can't honestly say that you know that's really that big. So and yet, no, we don't know how many children were sacrificed. In my opinion, it really doesn't matter. And uh, we have not found found a mass grave yet, which once again, there might be a solution to that. Um, also, keep in mind that waterways have changed over you know that many thousands of years. It is possible that what we're looking for is actually now at the bottom of a river or a sea. So these are just ideas. Um, that, but then the other evidences of evil are just numerous. I couldn't, we shouldn't. I'm not even going to write them all down because they're so numerous. I'm just going to focus on these two. Many idols have been discovered, so we know that they were worshiping other gods, and their occult activity is well documented. God says, God said that that was a big reason why he was kicking them out because of their uh, seances and all those different things. We have well documented proof that they were involved in the occult, so there, that shouldn't be a surprise there. Um, another thing that they were doing is they were doing things like with adultery and that kind of stuff. It's hard to prove or disprove that. How do you prove how faithful people were in marriage? I mean, honestly. We're talking about uh, marriages that existed thousands of years ago. So with that being said, um, we shouldn't fret over the evidence that we don't have. There's more than enough evidence to suggest that it did happen exactly as the Bible said. And once again, remember that these people were actually there. <laughs> so unless you have some glaring uh, reason to prove that they were not actually there, you're faced with the, with the problem that we have a historical document that was written at the time that says that something did happen. Just because we ha don't have the proof to back it all up doesn't mean that we have to throw it out. So, uh, with that being said, I think you'll see that the Bible thus far, from Genesis on through to till the book of Judges, really has proved historically reliable, and nothing in it should concern us so far. Uh, and now that we're getting into 1 Samuel, you're really going to see how much proof there is for the different stuff. So, uh, any questions before we close out this section of, of Israel to never open again? Again. <laughs> A couple things. Yes. Um, 
wasn't it that the Christians were known to um, bury their dead, not other people, right? Or is that an odd thing? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. I feel like you're referring to a specific event. Um, no, ancient people did bury their dead. Uh, we've oh, got. Was it just a Christian thing? Uh, as far as I know, no. Uh, the Egyptians buried theirs. Uh, ancient Mesopotamia buried theirs. Um, we have people in ancient Canaan that buried theirs. I mean, analyzing their graves are actually one of the ways that help us to learn what their average ages were, what they wore. Uh, I mean, there's that mass grave that we found in um, somewhere in Mesopotamia that had it was a mass grave, you know. So the guy died, and he, they threw his like his woman and his belongings and his oh, horse and right. stuff in there. And, well, granted, it's the only example we have of that. We have, but still, and so that was like 2000 BC or some nonsense like that. So as far as I can tell, humans have been burying their dead for a substantial amount of time. And uh, that's actually one of the things that argues for um, Neanderthals being actually just people is because they had religious observances and they buried their dead. So, or at least had some kind of ritual involved with their dead. Does that answer that? Yeah, it does. Okay. Another thing is um, if they were, you know, like, like you said, a thing that they may have been doing was um, sacrificing their firstborn. Well, wouldn't they sacrifice, you know, as a newborn? And wouldn't it be like, you know, not a mass grave? Because when a newborn is born, they kill, they sacrifice it, and then they have its own grave, right? I should have said that clearer. Um, so, yes, I, I, I didn't mean I can see how I said that wrong. Okay. Um, there is a city that has been excavated that we found the grave for it. it was a, I believe it was a cross on the other side of the river. And there was a number of babies uh, buried in the grave, but not enough to warrant sacrifice, just the average um, loss through you know, babies like naturally dying. Yeah, right, through diseases, not being born healthy, those kinds of things. Um, for instance, maybe back then you had, you had a baby who had problems like, for instance, um, retardation, uh, things like that. It's a lot less likely back then that they're going to survive. If they can't get the medical help that they, that they need, I mean, it's a lot less likely. Um, I, be, I believe there's actually um, a Greek uh, a Greek city that used to sacrifice their uh, – or abandon, I should say, uh, their mis, um, misborn babies. They would inspect them. I, I want to say that. Don't quote me on that because I'm not great on Greek history. But um, what was your question? Oh, I was saying wouldn't there not be a mass grave? Okay, yes. Um but we would still find a mass amount of babies in the grave. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I know I said that wrong, but that's what I was saying. No, we are not looking for a grave that just has a bunch of dead babies in it. Oh. We're, we're not looking for that. Oh. We're looking for m enough babies in a grave site to warrant something above just how many children died natural. Oh, I see. So, does that make sense? Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of babies have been found. Uh, well, there was one woman um, who was found. Oh, I want to say it was somewhere around Megiddo in Canaan, uh, where Israel now. Uh, that uh, she died when she was pregnant, and so her and then she's her body was found. You know, her her bones were found, and then the the partially formed uh, child. Really? It looks like she was about eight months along. Wow. Uh, yeah. Pretty sad, huh? Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that uh, in graves, absolutely. But nothing to subs to war So that brings up a whole nother question. Did they just bury them like normal? Did they bury them? Yeah. Uh, did they have a separate grave for them? Um, when they did do child sacrifices, did they do it all at once, like one festival in a year, for instance? Or did they do it throughout the year? So I mean, like for instance, Israel on the eighth day um, after a child was born, a male child was born, they had the circumcision. So did they follow like a similar thing where after like eight days, for instance, they child sacrifice the child, or did they like take it from the woman who just gave labor and sacrifice it then, or did they wait for that day of the year? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, these are questions that I don't think we have the answer to any of these things. And obviously, how you answer those questions determines what kind of proof you have for the event. Any other questions? I just don't understand how people don't uh, take the Bible as a historical document when we take other things as a historical document. For instance, 
take the Egyptian writings. Well, there's besides what they wrote. How is there how is there proof to back up that what they wrote is true? You know, same thing with the Bible. You know what I mean? Well, unless I, you were there, you can't prove that it's true. So shouldn't we just take their word for it? I have a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> A lot of opinions about that, and none of them favor the current um, academic circles. Th there's something I call it fart sniffing. There's something where you get so smart that you actually kind of get dumb, right. and then yeah. you start like huffing your own farts. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm just so smart and cultured. You lowlies who believe the Bible, and it's like, well, and so then they take things and take them out of context. And then they twist them and say, oh, there's no proof of that of ever happening. And it's like, if you would have done any amount of legwork, you would have... I mean, this most of what I'm showing you is my own research. Me studying a long freaking time to find this stuff. Most of everything. I'm not teaching you a lesson. I'm teaching you something from my heart. I'm showing, letting you see a glimpse of my innermost being. And you can see how much time and careful consideration have gone to these things. Unfortunately, the academic circle doesn't put that much care and thought into it. They don't want it to be true, first off, because it has the whole religious aspect. And Christianity is, like, you know, a thing, and they don't really want it. But other historical documents have a religious, like, I know. Egyptian, right? I know. But aside from a few... Dune pagans, Dune, you know, not Dune like a racial turn. I mean, Dune like a, um, you know, people who who don't live in the culture. You know, uh, barbarians. A few barbarian pagans, you don't really have that much. Well, not so much anymore. Nowadays, there are a lot of people in like America, for instance, who have gone back to their pagan roots. But it used to be that only the 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 uncultured people were, were still pagans. So they really didn't have the whole problem of, of public uh, whiplash, you know, whip back, you know. There's a lot of other things, too. A lot of times people decide that they don't want to believe something, you know what I mean? And yeah. so then they just kind of let that go with it. I mean, th consider over your life, for instance, the things that you wanted to believe. And so you found proof to validate that belief because you wanted to believe it. No, I understand. It's very difficult to challenge your – let's say, for instance – I could prove scientifically 100% that abortion was not wrong, that you weren't actually killing a child, you were doing no more than masturbating. Let's say I could prove it to you scientifically. How willing would you be to have, even have that conversation? Yeah. Probably not really. Yeah, and then people that grew up learning something, it's very difficult to change their point of view. Yeah. Like, the people that, you know, like, grow up like a... Mormon or, or Jehovah's Witness, well, when they become an adult, it's kind of hard to, you know, show up a different point of view because they've been, you know... Well, then there's another problem that it's kind of just the natural kickback that's happened with all of our knowledge that we've gained. Okay, before, like, the Bible said that there were people called the Babylonians. And we're like, there were no people called the Babylonians. Well, now we know that the Babylonians were actually a major empire. We didn't know that before. And so then we had so much knowledge that came at us so fast within the span of a hundred years that now all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what do I do with this? And so we take something and say, oh, well, so yeah, this proves that the Bible wasn't, wasn't true. And the difference between one generation and another, this generation was discovering that the Babylonians existed, and this generation was discovering, hey, these stories don't line up. Well, one of them has to not be true. Obviously, it was the one that was written for a religious reason. See what I mean? Yeah. For whatever reason, religious people are considered uh, biased, and is somehow unbiased to not be religious. I, I still can't figure that one out. <laughs> you being biased by not being biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's like cool. it's like for instance self righteousness. I was I just wrote a blog about this self righteousness. Self-righteous is people think that religious people are self-righteous, but the truth is uh, people are self-righteous, not religious people. People are, so, are self-righteous. You know, like, for instance, uh, somebody goes into a church, and what's the first thing that they do? They, they judge it. Yeah. They judge, you know, how the music is, how the pastor is. It, they're, they're wanting to be entertained. They are, they, are, they are criticizing. 
But then Christians should criticize them. It's like, okay. Yeah. A lot of atheists <laughs> I've met and uh, talked to over the years are they're very, uh, are seen that they're very strict. Yeah, like, and then they're like, oh, I don't need God. So you're saying that you have a righteousness of your own, you're good enough. Isn't that self-righteous? <laughs> I mean, I know that you're irritated with the religious people. I know you're. I know you're irritated with the religious people for looking down on you, but aren't you kind of looking down on other people? Yeah. Whatever. Hypocrisy. <laughs> Hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, it's 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 a human problem. So I I hope that that kind of makes sense. Is there any other questions? I don't think so. Nope. No. No questions. Okay, we're good. No questions asked except for. <laughs> The good news, guys, is that there are no more controversial issues with the archaeology. Oh, okay. The, no, the, the flood and the numbers of Israel and there's one other thing. Oh, my dating for the Exodus. Those were very controversial things. And now we've gotten past that. Now we don't have to get into controversial anymore. It's just the facts of it. What about the whale? The whale? You mean Le the Leviathan thing? Is that what we're talking oh, about? the crocodile. No, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about um, Jonah and the whale. Oh, oh that it's a fish. I'm not even going to look at that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to look at that. I am going to explain the whole thing that he's, well, we'll look at that another time. Okay. It was the kraken. Okay, so.